Okay, our next speaker today is Connie Manis. And Connie's going to be talking about potential tributaries and streams. Um, a little bit about Connie. Connie is the uh, part time executive director of the Kent Land Trust, an accredited community land trust with nearly 2,500 acres under conservation in both key and easements. With a background in both nonprofit law and public administration, and he also works on private consultants and land trust throughout New England and the tri-state area, providing organizational assessment, strategic planning, policy development, grant writing, and operation for accreditation. He also serves as a circuit writer for the Land Trust Alliance, covering Connecticut and Rhode Island. She volunteers as chairperson of the Town of Kent Conservation Commission and is a steering committee member of the Connecticut Land Conservation Council, sharing, sharing its training with the Education Subcommittee. Please welcome Tom. together 
to organize the large landowners and get them to conserve their land. You know, where, where can we have land trusts work together to do exactly what we were just talking about? Um, so, uh, they pulled together some of these land trusts to work in the east and west Aspatug <coughs> watersheds. And they were looking at the Kent Land Trust, the Antonov Heritage Land Trust, Warren Land Trust, Deep Rock, I'm sorry, I don't have actually I put my slides in front of me. Connecticut Farm Land Trust, um, and then some others in those watersheds. And that's how this Aftatuck Watershed Partnership was born. And then, um, realizing that we didn't have quite the uh, educational um, network that we needed, we pulled in the Pump Road River Watershed Coalition and Rivers Alliance um, for some educational um, uh, meat and potatoes. And that's how the, uh, the partnership was, was born. Okay. So um, it was really the Green River Collaborative, the part of the conserved land of uh, HVA that, that's, you know, kind of gave this, that fledged this. Um, it began as a way to kind of drill down and take more focused approach at connecting with landowners to conserve their land. But we also realized we could do a better job of connecting with landowners about how to best care for their land um, and do some river education. And why? Because most of us really have education and good stewardship as part of our missions too, and I expect that you all do have a component of that as land trusts. So it's kind of the norm. Um, and rivers in the Northeast are becoming progressively more impaired um, because of increased impervious surface, uh, surfaces here uh, in the Northeast in particular. So even though the Clean Water Act of 1972 kind of initially led to some improvement in rivers, um, that's you know, we've experienced a bit of a decline because of all of the development in the Northeast. And so we decided that some river education might be helpful for our landowners and also be a useful tool to engaging landowners. At least that was the initial thought. Um, so, uh, uh, what is, what, what's happening here? Let me just give you a little description of the rivers that we're working with. This is a map of uh, you know, for, for actually for Kent um, and for the partners that we started looking at um, initially with the Green Plan, we were really focusing on the East and the West Aspatuck rivers. Let me just characterize those for you briefly. The uh, West Aspatuck um, is really a less developed area. So um, here we were working with a cleaner river, uh, less development. Um, less impermeable service, surfaces, um, more riparian buffers, um, so better um, rivers there, better rivers and streams. With the East Aspatuck and with the Pombra rivers, there's more development, more businesses to work with. Um, so, you know, in a way, not as great results in terms of talking to the landowners around what they could do, but there's more opportunity for an intervention there. So, you know, it, it's a, a double-edged sword. You know, there, there was um, the news wasn't quite as good, but there was probably more opportunity for intervention um, and higher visibility. So um, that that's the difference between the rivers. So what did we do? This is what we came to talk about. So the purpose of the project was to engage the landowners in learning and caring about the watershed and the water bodies that were closest to them, to encourage them to adopt best practices, um, caring for their own property and how to use water in their own homes, um, and then if appropriate to start talking to them about how to preserve their own property but in some cases, they didn't have large enough properties to preserve, so it was enough just to teach them about how to do that. Okay, so what did we do? First, we had to find out who they were, and this is where the land trusts were critical. So we had a partnership of HVA and Rivers Alliance and the Conkrog River Watershed Coalition, but the land trusts really were the ones that had the personal relationships with the landowners. And so the first thing to do, really, was to identify who the landowners were that were closest to the rivers. And we took the tax maps and we drew, this is not like highly technological, but we drew a line around the watersheds. And 
you know, we had our databases, we had our memberships, and we knew who these people were. So it was easier for us to reach out to them. And we made a list of who the landowners were. And we sent them an invitation. Hey, you're special. You're invited to find out how to be more river smart. We designed a nice looking logo. <laughs> and we invited them to a neighborhood gathering. You know, it's not just everyone in the world. It's you and your neighbors. You're special because you live near a river. You want to find out more about how to be river smart. Um, we, we scheduled events in three fun locations, and this is what Tyler is talking about. Um, they were important to the neighborhoods. They were associated heavily with the land trust. They were also associated with the river, so they were nearby. Uh, this one here, this is the Smursky Farm. This is uh, with the Vientanov Heritage Land Trust. Um, it's a preserved farm. It's close to the West Aspetuck. It's in New Milford. Uh, it's not somewhere, I mean, although it's public land, it's not like it's open every day, you know, I don't mean it's close to the public, but it's just not some place that you would go. So people would want to go there. Um, this, I don't have a picture of the actual schoolhouse, but this is the Kent Land Trust Kent Hollow Preserve, and it's across the road from a small one-room schoolhouse in Kent Hollow that is never open. I mean, it was dirty in time when we opened it up, but we swept it up made it pretty. No one ever has a party in there and you know, daffodils and tablecloths and we held these events in you know the end of April, so Earth Day connotations and food, you know, so refreshments will be served. I'm sure that's on the invite I could go back. But you know, it was like and the timing of the events was carefully considered, you know, so the time of the day and we made these people feel special. And then of course follow up phone calls just like Tyler was saying. So the hand-pickedness of the feeling of these events made a real difference. Um, this is also the Camp Hollow Preserve. It's probably a way to be honest. Um, and, uh, and then this third one, the third event that we did was at the Platt Nature Center on the East Aspetuck. Um, also something that has a, an association with that river and means some things to the families in that area. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think that the location made a difference to the people that we got out. Um, and we developed materials. So then that was the, you know, we scheduled these events, we developed materials, uh, including um, a survey uh, to find out what our guests knew about the watershed. So we wanted some baseline uh, information. We wanted to know what they knew about the watershed, the health of the water courses in the region, modern threats to clean water. We also wanted to engage them. So we wanted to kind of spark their imagination and get them talking. So we didn't want to make it very difficult. Um, but we wanted to kind of bring them in. And then we made this pledge. And we asked them to take the pledge. Um, and I always get this song, let it, let it go, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so forgive me if I do that for you too. But you know, these are like the basic elements. We encourage them to be lazy. Let go. Don't, don't intervene as much on your property. Let it grow. Don't cut your lawn so much. Put some buffers, plant your rain gardens, all these things that you all probably know about. But um, I think I printed out copies of the edge, but I don't know. Um, okay, and let it grow, and then let it flow, also. So things, you know, like um, pervious surfaces, uh, rain gardens, swales, and pumping your septic tank regularly. We printed this pledge um, up and encouraged folks to take the pledge and to share it with their friends. So this was a um, social networking type idea. You know, I told five friends and they told five friends and things like that. And people signed up because we had them in a captive audience where all their neighbors were looking. And so there was peer um, pressure. Okay. So, and then we promised them that if they took the pledge, we would give them a long sign that they could put out on their lawn and then everyone would know that they were very smart. So, 
Um, and then we asked them to pass that information on. So the follow-up to that event, because we did do follow-up, is we did that at the beginning of the summer, and we asked them to try it out. And then we would invite them back and see how it went. So we sent them another invitation in February. And we had them some food off. And so more food, of course. Thank you for participating. Come give us your feedback. Specialness. And based on their feedback, we created additional materials using our branding, um, the pledge. Uh, we, um, we went to places that people were going to meet. You know, this is based on their feedback. We, um, we created a postcard, which I'm going to pass along. We put our stuff in the town land use offices. We created social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We get we went to the farmers <coughs> market and other outdoor festivals. And we created a refrigerator magnet. So you can remind yourself of your pledge and check off the things that you're doing. This is the coolest. I'm going to pass this around. This is mine. Okay. So. But what did we learn? All right. What did people know? They know. Um, this is what we learned from the survey. They really care about clean water. They know that trash is a problem, fertilizer is a problem. What they don't know, they're really not clear on what happens to storm water when it falls on the ground. They think that maybe the storm drain just goes to a processing plant. They don't really know that it's just an interest river. Um, they uh, don't know, um, they don't know a lot about the other things like how often they should have their septic or how often they should have it inspected. They, you know, they, they're really unclear on things like that. Just like, I don't know if you should be the car. Um, they're not sure about whether their small changes would make a difference if they're willing to try. Um, but they told us that one-on-one -on -one is the best message to deliver, and they really wanted to do more neighborhood gatherings. They really enjoyed that, and they asked us to do a block party all the time. And not to overwhelm them with the pledge. They said, keep it simple. Although the pledge item seemed easy, it ended up not being as easy as it seemed. And they need more information and more interaction all the time. And we went like, wow, we're four people. We can do that. Um, so ultimately, we were the most effective when we were talking to people about things that were really familiar to them. And so this kind of gets back to the point that we can't have too big of a group. That people really need to feel like it's relevant to them, that they're talking to them about their backyard. Um, and that's hard to do because, you know, the smaller it is, the more it is. Um, and even different factors like students to that So you know, this is kind of a number. We went on social media and, yes, you know, we folks wanted to talk about products in our know, that's not relevant to each and every person, but that's what really resonates. And so, um, um, that's really how we got to this idea of going to the festivals and going to the town land use offices and trying to make an impact, you know, by meeting people where they went. Like, that's how we felt we could be the most efficient with the limited resources that we had. But we weren't quite in the sweet spot, um, we thought. Uh, you know, one of the things um, I wanted to mention that we did in terms of engagement, you know, was bringing back what's relevant with the landowner. Um, I mean, this is kind of out of context, but I just mentioned it as an engagement tool, is that we always had a map in our neighborhood gatherings where people could come in and just a thumbs where they live. And that, um, 
them feel at home, but also help them engage with all of the other people who were there. And that works really well no matter what you're doing, the watershed engagement or you know, any gathering that you have. Um, and that helps people start to know each other too. Um, I, I still think that one of the ways that we're going to be more effective, effective is mobilizing the people who are these to go back out. I just don't know how we're going to do that. So uh, we think that we've done a pretty good job, um, but it's taken a long time. And to me, the social media thing um, seems to be big and unfocused. Um, and you know, again, I put down there any measure of success. Like, are we winning? You know, people want to know, like, are you having an impact? So, um, so further directions. What are we doing in 2015? Um, with our 2015 grant money, and it's not a lot, and I, you know, that's another thing too, is that when you come to a couple of the university, you can really start to think about what makes people change. I do a lot of thinking about that. What makes anyone do anything? Uh, incentives, game theory, um, largesse, you know, the feel good component of this, competition with your neighbor, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, so <laughs> um, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to build on our strengths. We really are branding. We're encouraging people to join us in this. We're really open to, you know, steal this movie, steal this sign, steal our pledge, join us in this effort that River Smart is not trademarked. In fact, we stole it. So. <laughs> Uh, we think that it's important to get some uh, science-based data, and so we're going to apply um, a riparian analysis to our watershed areas so that we can give some feedback to how the rivers are doing. Uh, we want to move forward with the concept of business ambassadors so that the businesses along the rivers can share our materials and also start to think about how they themselves would be in River Smart. Um, let's build a partnership. Uh, I did say this, our goal is to make being river smart as normal, um, commonplace is bringing your bags to the supermarket. I mean, these are not difficult concepts, you know, that's what our landlord said to us, you know, we need these easy to do, you know, these simple changes can make a difference. So how do we incentivize them and how do we make it easier for people to do without two Filling the message too much and making it too diffuse. So, uh, I don't know where we are on time, but I really wanted to get your thoughts on this. Um, you know, it's been a really rewarding and fun project to work on. Um, and uh, I, I do struggle, though, uh, with you know some of these balances of how do we push it out? Uh, how much control do we need to have? You know, facilitating the idea of facilitating versus building a network and you know really making a difference. What do you think? How do you measure success? How do you measure success? Were people changing? The river is being cleaner? How do you think?
in Norfolk, we have a, a river rangers program that's into the schools. Schools throughout check the water content, the funds of the water, the area that surround the water, and it goes into their trips as again it, it keeps them part of the common sense approach to keeping water clean. And uh, is it accessible to well, them? As much as it can be. But again, if you bring it into the into their that sweet spot of a home run for the little ones, we'll carry them to their adulthood as well. Get one or two of them. Yep. We do macroinvertebrates with the Conservation Commission in yep. town and uh, a little bit on the dot. Yeah. Macroinvertebrates mm -hmm. but that's tangible that you're going to have it that's part of it. And so if we got a school group coming in and do a new stuff, that's uh, you essentially create more than you have to do that now. And that creates a success story. And you can probably talk about the experience of what you call it swim.
you know, and so I'm just wondering, like, how that, how that was successful, but it was also, it relied more on the reputation of the Comprise and the Watershed Coalition. And I'm just wondering if, you know, I mean, it, it seemed to be successful, but how does that change your opinion of the outreach? And would that change the model for any of you down here? Um, and how does that impact what we do in terms of our planned activities for next year? I mean, are we going in the right direction still? Do we need to pull this back and do more neighborhood? Or should we continue on the social media? What do you think? So just a thought. Um, what, what you just talked about with the Clumper Act, my guess is you're getting people who know about them anyway. And anything they have will probably show up. And you're not getting people who don't know about you, don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to think through who are you really, are you trying to reach out beyond the regular flyer, so to speak. Um, and I say the same thing about your postcard, is that if I look at this and I say, who's their audience? I would say people who think they're environmentalists is your audience here. Just look at this postcard. Right? Is that clear about, like, how does that relate to what Bill said at the end of um, So the question is, yeah, yeah so, if you really have um, a large audience that you're drawing from, so your low-hanging fruit will be people who think they're environmentalists, so in which case this is fine. But if you think those folks are already pretty much kind of in the line of doing this kind of stuff anyway, and you try to get people who don't think they're environmentalists, then they're not going to see themselves in this right away. So it really depends on where you think you are with the, the so the population in the area that you're concerned about in terms of your conservation. That's really helpful. Yeah. I'm going to think about that the whole way home. Huh? <laughs> 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 I have two thoughts um, popped into my head. I, one was that it, it seems that people were concerned about their health, you know, personal health, water. Does, there, does that have an impact on me, you know, toxicity in the water that's around me? I mean, something that maybe just strikes home more than like they may not know a rain garden, for example, but they know that the, this water I mean, it needs to be healthy because. Um, and then the other thing I had, I think that someone mentioned the idea of galvanizing young people with kids in the schools and maybe you can have a contest, you know, do a YouTube video, we'll pick the best one and we'll go viral, you know, about how to keep this water clean. Just some incentive to get maybe kids involved because they're so good with the social media. Um, so it's just a thought. You know, that would be maybe going through the school, the school network. Mm -hmm. uh, how much, how much longer do we have? I think we're about it. Yeah. Yeah, I was going with school teacher. I teach this stuff every day, and one of the things we do, we do a frog wash as well. And you'd be amazed as you go north to south in Connecticut, the amount of frogs disappear in the rivers. And that gets the kids speaking. And part of the assignment is talk to your parents at night about your assignment today. We do a, a, a chemical study of the water. We do a, a you know, macro, macro it's, it's fine, but you know, it's, it's not that big a deal. But when you talk about the storm, we have a storm. How that changed? Where's that stuff coming from? Makes you wonder, what, what, you're, everyone was downstream eventually. And it's coming downstream from some of upstream. Where and why? How's it getting down here? What's happening? And we have, right where I'm involved with watershed, we have a clearinghouse for this information. And then it goes right to the state of Connecticut as well. So if we find a pollution spot, it goes to our clearinghouse, right to the state. And then we investigate that as well. But again, it's, it's getting the kids involved is as important right now as getting it done. Because eventually they're going to be in charge. Thank you so much for your